So we are working our way through the book of Romans at the moment, and um, we've, we've kind of done this from the start of the year and taken breaks at various points. Uh, we've got to chapter 14 now. Um, I don't know if anyone's feeling like, haven't we been in Romans forever? Uh, so if you're thinking that, I just want to tell you what I, um, what I was reading this week. I was reading about Martin Lloyd-Jones. Martin Lloyd-Jones um, was a well-known 20th century Welsh preacher, um, and he preached in uh, Westminster Chapel in, uh, in London. And he started a series working his way through the book of Romans verse by verse. And he started in October 1955, and he finished in March 1968, and he preached 366 sermons um, on Romans. Um, so I've counted up. This is uh, this is this is number 13. So just uh, just saying, just consider yourself um, let off um, a, a little bit lightly. Uh, but the, the the theme that uh, that we've been following as we've been working our way through the book of Romans, the theme is welcome in, welcome in to ultimately Romans is, it's about the, the gospel, it's about the good news of Jesus, and it's, and it's Paul's most um, kind of worked out theology of, of the gospel. Um, and so he's saying welcome into the love of God. Welcome into the freedom that you can have from the things that separate you and get in the way of you um, experiencing that love and having that relationship with Him. Welcome into uh, to forgiveness and to new life in Jesus. And then welcome into the freedom that that new life brings you. And then he goes on to, uh, to, to say, you are, you're welcome into life in the Spirit as God, uh, as God makes His Holy Spirit generously available to you and to me to enable us to live the life that He calls us to live. Um, and that's kind of in a ridiculously tiny nutshell, the first eight chapters um, of Romans. And, and then um, 9 to 11, he's, he's focusing on a welcome in to people of all races, of all backgrounds, of, of different uh, religious backgrounds. And he's saying, in Jesus, there is no barrier, there are no no-go zones for this welcome that we have. Um, and then from chapter 12 onwards, he's, he's kind of looking at the implications of this welcome, the implications of the gospel for how we live and how we live out His welcome in the, in the world around us. And so we come to, uh, to chapter 14 um, and, the, and the first part of, of chapter 15. Um, and really, it's, it's about um, how we are welcomed into a community that in turn looks to mirror the welcome of God. As a church, our, our strap line is a community living to make Jesus known. Um, and as a community, we, we want to live that out, to experience um, the love and the welcome of Jesus, to live in the reality of the gospel, and then to mirror that welcome to the people around us. First of all, to mirror that welcome among us, because um, the, the New Testament is full of the language of, of family. Another way to say a community living to meet Jesus known might be a family on a mission. And, and that's, what, that's what we are called to be as we experience and then mirror the welcome of Jesus. Um, in, in our lives, in our relationships with one another, and then that is seen out in the wider world. Um, so, whether this is your, your first time here at Broadway or whether you are a very long-term uh, regular at, um, at Broadway, I, I, want to, I want to say welcome in. Welcome in as we look to, <laughs> frankly, imperfectly live out the welcome of Jesus live out the gospel of Jesus among us and look to be this community of love. 
And I feel that for my part, I have such a long way to go. Um, and I suspect we all have, but God has given us the Holy Spirit to enable us to live out that welcome. Um, so Paul starts this, uh, this chapter, chapter 14. He starts off saying there's a welcome to both the strong and the weak. Um, in the message translation, um, verse 1 says, Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. It's easy, isn't it, to welcome and to love people who um, look like you, who talk like you, who have the same set of values as you. And it's easy to share fellowship with people like that, but the call of the gospel is to go beyond that with one another, to welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. Um, so, a quick question. Anyone here who's a vegetarian or a vegan? Yep, we've got, uh, we, we've got a few. It, it has to be said, Paul gives you a bit of a rough ride here. Just, just saying. So, he says, uh, verse 2, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. <laughs> and there's some, there's some die-hard carnivores here going, yeah. <laughs> However, we shouldn't rip Scripture out of its, its context. Um, do you know, when uh, Alison and I were out for a meal um, this week, and I was, I was noticing on the menu how many things, how many uh, vegetarian and vegan um, things there were on the menu, and, and some of them even looked like they might be tasty, possibly. <laughs> um, but it, it wasn't always like that. I remember when I was young, you know, um, as a child, you know, if you, if you went out somewhere and, um, and you said, I'm a vegetarian, have you got something vegetarian? Chances are they would have brought you a ham salad. Um, but <laughs> it's true. Um, and and people, people choose um, not to eat meat for, uh, for a number of, uh, of reasons. Um, uh, We've been, we've been thinking recently about, um, about COP26 and, uh, and for a lot of people there are good ecological reasons to, um, to reduce the, the ecological toll um, on our land uh, and on our planet by, uh, by eating vegetables. For, uh, uh, for some it's about, um, it's about animal welfare, for others it's about health or, uh, or personal preference. In Paul's day it would have been none of these things. Um, and uh, and in, he was writing to, uh, to Christians in Rome, uh, and the church in Rome was, was made up of um, Christians who had become Christians out of a Jewish context, um, and those who had become Christians um, from, uh, from other religions, um, from the worship of, uh, of other gods. <coughs> and when he's talking about eating meat, he's talking in that context. So there would be, um, th there would be Jews in Rome uh, who wanted to eat meat, but they would only eat meat if it was, if it was kosher, if it had been um, killed and treated in, a, in accordance with, um, with the, uh, the Jewish food regulations. Um, and Quite possibly, in Rome, it was hard to get meat that you know had been killed in a kosher way. Um, and then there would be lots of Christians who came out of a, a Gentile context, um, and uh, the, the butcher shop was often next door to, uh, to the temple, and the, uh, the meat was killed, sacrificed in the temple, and then taken next door to the butcher shop to be cut up. Um, and sold, and this meat had been sacrificed, it had been offered to other gods. Um, so there would be people um, from a, uh, people who had come out of these temples and come out of worshipping these, uh, these gods, and, and they wouldn't want to eat the meat because for them that would, that would just be such a hardwired connection to these old ways that they had left behind. Um, and then there would be some Jewish Christians um, who wouldn't want to eat that meat because of its association with idolatry, because of its association with, uh, with false gods. 
Um, and so this was a very real and live issue. It's not that Paul was just going, eh, well, some are vegetarian and some aren't, you know, just that's fine, get along with each other. This was, this was a very much a live issue where, he, where he's saying we are not to judge one another. Um, so uh, so in, the, in the church um, at Rome, um, there was a guy called Albert, because uh, it's a good um, Roman name, you know. Um, and uh, and Albert, Albert would not eat meat that had been, uh, well, he, he didn't eat meat at all. And, and, and for him, he saw that, the, uh, that society around him was, was so corrupt and full of the worship of, um, of false gods. And, and he, he wanted to be pure, and he wanted nothing to do with that worship of false gods. And, and if not, not eating meat was, was the price to pay for that, then that was a, a small price to pay. Um, but then Albert would see Bertha Bertha went to the same church as Albert, and, um, and he spotted her nipping into the butchers um, next door to the temple. Um, and although he never said anything, he always, he always thought, oh, that's a shame, Bertha. I, I thought Bertha was a woman who had a real faith, but, but she's, she's clearly not because she's, you know, she's, she's compromising herself in this way. And while he never said anything, he judged Bertha in his heart. Meanwhile, Bertha, Bertha went into the uh, the butchers and uh, got a got her um, her cut of steak and some sausages and um, uh, and came home. Um, and Bertha knew that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and that included. Um, the cuts of meat that were in the butcher shop. She, she knew that these false gods were no gods at all, um, and so she was, felt free to, uh, to eat the meat. She, she knew that Jesus had said, it's not, what, um, it's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean, it's what comes out of them. And, and so she knew that, uh, that holiness isn't about external regulations, it's about the heart. And Bertha was delighted to be able to be able to exercise her freedom in Jesus. Uh, in fact, she would sometimes rub other people's noses in it. She'd, she'd spotted Albert the other day, um, and uh, she saw him. And she wasn't going to go into the butchers at the moment, but because she saw him, she thought, "I'll go in just now. That will really set his nose out of joint. But I'll, I'll just show him what it's like to exercise real freedom." So, in the same church as um, Albert and, uh, and Bertha, um, there, were, there were two other people, um, Callum and Daphne. Um, and Callum, Callum had been brought up um, in a context, he'd, he'd been brought up in a Christian family, and he'd been brought up to observe uh, the Sabbath. Um, so he never watched television um, um, on the Sabbath day. It was quite easy, actually, in ancient Rome to never watch television. Now I think about it. Um, but he, um, he, never, he never went to the chariot races um, on, the, on the Sabbath, and he always kept the day uh, very uh, distinct and, uh, and separate. Um, and, he, and he considered this, if he was being honest, he considered this to be one of these tests are you a true Christian or not? Do you keep the Sabbath as I keep the Sabbath? Because that's the sign of being a true Christian. Um, meanwhile, Daphne, uh, Daphne believed that, uh, that all days are sacred, all days are holy to God, um, and that uh, she didn't feel the need to keep a particular day special. Um, and really, uh, really, she was a bit judgmental of, of people who were so um, kind of tied up in old covenant regulations that they felt that, uh, that that was the way to live. And this, these, these examples of Albert and Bertha and, and Callum and, um, and Daphne, um, the, these were examples that Paul chose very deliberately. 
um, because these were kind of religious boundary markers. They were identity markers, particularly um, for Jewish Christians. Um, but, uh, but the handling of food would also be true of, uh, uh, of other groups. And it's, it's, not, it's not clear whether Paul was talking about the Sabbath or whether he was talking about um, feast days, um, you know, special, uh, special days in the, in the Jewish calendar. But either way, in picking on these two things, on, um, on foods and on days that are set aside for God, he was getting to things that were considered to be right at the heart of um, certainly uh, a Jewish Christian's understanding of, uh, of their identity. Um, and, and Paul was making clear, I, I do have my own views on this. I do believe that actually all things are, you know, we, we can eat all things, but you need to bear with each other, and you need to bear with each other's consciences, and you need to not judge one another when you deal with these things. Um, because actually, your identity is not bound up in the externals. Your identity is someone who has experienced the welcome of Jesus and who is called to mirror that welcome to others in non-judgmental love. So, what does that look like today? What does it look like for us? Probably it's not the same thing for us. You know, whether, um, whether people choose to uh, eat meat or not. I, I think for most of us, we will um, accept each other and, and our choices there without really thinking all that much about it. Maybe, maybe for some of us, it's uh, in, in a church context, it's about worship style. You know, do you, uh, do you prefer to have a long block of songs? Do you prefer to have a few songs? Do you prefer to have no songs? Um, maybe, um, maybe in a kind of wider churches context, you know, for, for some, worshiping God will involve quietness and candles. Um, for, uh, for others, worshiping God might be a, um, a thrash metal set, um, not coming soon to a church near you, probably. Um, uh, for others, worshiping God might involve um, uh, using icons to help them f focus on, on God. If you look at the worldwide church, there is this enormous variety of worship styles. Um, and sometimes it can be easy to judge others and to look and say, well, they're not worshiping in a way that looks to me to be spirit-filled. So, I'm not sure that they are truly um, worshiping God when we, uh, when we gather together. Um, maybe, a, maybe another issue uh, today might be, might be alcohol and, and some Christians who will abstain from alcohol and others who will, uh, will choose to, uh, to, to drink and will consider that to be fine. In Paul's day, the, the big issues that were these, these markers of Christian identity, these kind of tests of orthodoxy were to do with what you do with food and what you do with the Sabbath. And I wonder what these tests of orthodoxy might be for us today. Maybe, maybe it's something to do with how God created the world. How about that one? So, for, uh, for, for, for Christians, what is, is very clear is the belief that God created the heavens and the earth. Did He create the earth in six literal days, or did He take a longer period of time? Is the earth a few thousand years old, or is it four and a half billion years old? And for a lot of Christians um, on kind of either end of these spectrums, these can be, uh, these can be considered almost as, as tests of orthodoxy. And I, and I think into that context, Paul would say you need to 
bear with one another in love and not judge one another. And it's not that these things are completely unimportant. It's not that we, do, that we don't and shouldn't strive after truth, and, and Paul very clearly does in the matter of food. But he says, let's make room for, con for the conscience of one, of one another. I think something that we have hardly even begun to explore, um, I think church at large and, and, and us as well, is, is how, how, we, how we bear with one another in love where increasingly Bible-believing Christians have differing views on sexuality and gender issues. Um, and um, I'm not going to explore all of these things that have just um, that have just opened up because we'd be here for uh, for two hours, and it's not really the um, the focus. The focus this morning is about how do we how do we people be people who welcome the the mirror who who mirror the welcome of God among one another. How are we people who exercise non-judgmental love to one another. Now, Paul is not saying here, well, you know, whatever you believe, it's, it's, it's all fine. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. Just, um, just whatever you fancy, that, that will be okay. Because he says, he says, when you eat, you need to, if, if you choose to eat meat, then make sure you eat to the Lord. And if you choose not to eat meat, make sure you don't eat meat to the Lord. And we live to the Lord and we die to the Lord, he says. So, so he's saying that um, it's, it's not about our personal preferences as followers of Jesus. Our personal preferences, our personal desires are to be crucified. But it's about seeking with integrity to follow Jesus and to recognize that other people might come to different conclusions than you on some things, but they are still seeking with integrity to be followers of Jesus. They are still brothers and sisters. And Paul makes it abundantly clear in this passage that we are not to judge our brothers and sisters. Um, so, in so many ways, we we can, we can pass judgments just in, in little uh, hidden ways, and some, sometimes in ways that are expressed, but more often in ways that are just, uh, just hidden in our hearts. Um, it's easy to do. I, I think all of us, where, where, you know, where I do something that I think is um, that, that other people might, uh, might misinterpret, I want people to give me the benefit of the doubt. I want people to assume that my motives are good. The question is, do I then find myself making judgments on other people's motives when I can't possibly know what their motives are? And, and this, is why, this is why God says that we are not to judge, um, that the one who judges is God, and we will all stand before his judgment seat. But he says, in what you do, make sure that you don't exercise your freedoms in a way that, are, that presents a stumbling block to others. Um, I guess alcohol would be um, one clear example of that. If you drink alcohol, there are other times and places where for the sake of the consciences of others, it might be wise um, not to do so. Um, the, way, the ways you express your views, Paul says in, in verse 22, that there are some things that are, that are better just, that you just keep to uh, to yourself. So, what, what might you need to do or say differently in order to help others? And maybe you're feeling a certain tension in this and thinking, uh, look, sh surely there are, there are limits here. Surely it's not just all let's be nice to each other. So, um, let's... Um, Let's talk about Ernie and Faye. Um, and Ernie and Faye are, um, they're, they're not in, uh, in the church in Rome. They're, uh, they're actually recent, uh, recent people in Broadway. You've maybe not met them yet. Um, 
But uh, Ernie, um, Ernie has been uh, reading through his Bible, and he's come to Leviticus. And he's read this bit that says that, um, uh, that you shouldn't have mixed fibers in your clothes. Um, and so, um, Ernie has a, has a tender conscience, and he, and he wants to uh, he wants to do what the Bible says. So, um, so he's been through his wardrobe, and he's got rid of all of his poly cotton shirts, and he's got rid of his underwear and his socks that, 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 that have the, the lycra in them. And um, his, um, his, his wardrobe has become a lot, more, uh, a lot more minimal as a result. That's Ernie. And then there's Faye. Um, Faye says, well... I know it says in the Old Testament that you're not to steal, but in Colossians, Paul says, all things are yours. And that's, that's Old Testament, isn't it? You know, if we, if we, if we no longer wear shirts with, no, no longer bother about um, mixed fibers, and we no longer bother about eating shellfish, and these other things from the Old Testament, well, why, why do we bother about this? Um, so, um, so I, I'm actually quite comfortable in my conscience um, with, uh, with stealing. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I only steal if it's something that I want. Um, but, and, and I, I try not to judge these narrow-minded bigots who think differently from me. Now, I'm guessing pretty much all of us would, would think um, that for Ernie, you know, if he wants to get rid of his poly cotton shirts, then he can crack on, but really it doesn't make any difference. It's pretty irrelevant. And I guess that for all of us, we would say that no, Faye, stealing is wrong. But how do we know that? And how do we know that when we take examples that are not on the far out, most obvious edges of, uh, of things? How, how do we make that, uh, make that call? Um, we could spend time talking about um, the, the different types of Old Testament law. So there are moral laws and ceremonial laws and civil or judicial laws. Um, and each of these um, operates differently, and the moral law is something that we would see uh, carried forward. Um, and then we can, we can recognize that we need to always interpret the Bible in the light of itself. We interpret the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament. Um, so in terms of Faye's particular um, issue, you can see very clearly Jesus talks about stealing. Paul, you just go back one chapter to chapter 13, and he makes very clear that, um, that stealing is, uh, is wrong, that that is not an expression of the law of love for God and love for one another if we are stealing from, uh, from other people. So, Paul is not saying we can just agree to differ um, chapter 6, he says, shall we continue to sin in order that grace may abound by no means? Um, and, and actually, throughout the book of Romans, um, Paul sets out a moral framework. Now, Romans is very clear. It's, very, it's crystal clear on the core of our faith. One God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus, who died for our sins and rose again, and the call to people who would follow Him to live for Him in dependence on the Holy Spirit. Now, someone once said, on the essentials, unity, on the non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity or love. So, welcome into a community that mirrors God's welcome to us. And if you have not yet become part of God's people, then there's an invitation for you to respond to Jesus. 
you can come among us here in the room. You can be part of us um, online um, and have uh, no faith in Jesus and, uh, and everyone without exception um, is, is welcome. There is no one who is not welcome among us. The church, as the New Testament presents it, is the community of the redeemed. And so, Jesus' invitation to you is to accept Him and to allow Him to bring you new life, to recognize that on the cross that He has taken all the stuff that gets in the way of your relationship with Him, that He's taken your sin upon the cross, um, and to invite Him to be at the heart of your life. And then to recognize that that's not some sort of, that's not some sort of solo thing, that it's not a, a lone ranger thing where, where you just ride off into the sunset with Jesus, that we, that we grow into the likeness of Jesus in community and that we learn to mirror Jesus as we, uh, as we rub off against each other and as we come up against all of these difficult issues and things where we might disagree. Whether, whether you eat meat or don't, um, whether you drink alcohol or don't, um, whether you prefer to worship with thrash metal or candles, whether you believe that um, God created the world in a very short time or in a very long time. We are called to be a community of non-judgmental love, recognizing that the core is Jesus in you and Jesus in me. There are lots of things that are unimportant. There are some things that are significant. There are a few things that are critical and core. We do need to judge what is truth because there's, there are plenty of lies and deceptions out there, and, and the New Testament is very clear that we are called to be people of truth. So come along to Sunday Live tonight um, as we explore what it means to be people of truth in a post-truth world. And while we make judgment on what is truth, what we are called to never do is to judge a fellow believer. That's, that's God's job. We have enough time with the planks in our own eyes. So welcome in, and may we be people who are quick to welcome and slow to judge and ready to love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your welcome. Thank you for what we see of your welcome to prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners and um, people that, uh, that no one else would have the time for. Thank you for your welcome to us, to each one of us. Thank you that even, even before we knew you, even in our sin, yet you chose to welcome us and to love us and to reach out to us. Will you give us the grace to be people who leave the judgment to you? Will you enable us more and more to be a community of non-judgmental love? And by your grace, may we be known as a people who are quick to welcome, slow to judge, ready to love. And so may we mirror Jesus, and so may we give honor 
to you. And so may the world know that you are real because they see our love. We ask this in the name of Jesus and desperately dependent on the strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen.